Welcome once again to Along the Rio Grande. I'm George Torok, and we have joining us today Mary Kay Shannon. She's the park manager from the McGoffin Home State Historic Site. Mm -hmm. She's going to tell us all about some of the renovation work that's been done there. And she was nice to get enough to give us a tour a while back. We'll take a look at some of the uh, interior, especially at the McGoffin Home, and talk a little bit about how some of our viewers might help out as well. Great. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Maybe we should start by explaining what a state historic site is. Okay. Um, the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, a state agency, owns numerous sites across the state, both recreational and historic. Um, there's about 30 that are historic sites. All of us have a National Register designation and, and a recorded Texas landmark and are, are part of the system because of our, our history. And the McGoffin Home, why is it designated as a state historic site? The department pretty much follows the National Register uh, program guidelines. So you have to be over 50 years old. And we're basically 130 years old, mm. um, associated with significant individual or individuals. And we have both Joseph McGoffin, mayor of El Paso four times, uh, and James Wiley McGoffin, trader and merchant on Santa Fe and Chihuahua trails. We also have significant uh, architecture in our territory territorial building mm -hmm. uh, and it's much more common in New Mexico so it's a rare example in Texas of territorial architecture what is the territorial uh, architecture the simplest definition I can give you is it's an adobe hacienda with Greek revival detail in our case now, the McGoffin Home is actually part of a historic district. That's right? right. The city has designated several historic districts in El Paso. The McGoffin Home is the anchor for the McGoffin District. Uh, and it's an area about four or five blocks surrounding the McGoffin Home. Uh, and it includes both territorial and adobe construction. Uh, you'll also start seeing some Queen Anne and late Victorian construction, some of the early brick buildings for El Paso. And your position as a park manager, uh, what are your duties at the <laughs> McGoffin Home? We are a small historic site in, within our big organization. That means that everyone there wears multiple hats. Ah. Um, basically, I supervise every aspect of operations, from the guided tours to the groundskeeping to the maintenance and repair, and supervise the budget and staff. And how does someone become a park manager? What, what kind of background or experience does that I require? came from a museum uh, background, having already worked 20 years in, in museum operations outside the department. Um, but today, you have to have a, a college degree, a bachelor's uh, in museum science or education or related field. Um, and that's for historic sites. The, the recreational parks like Franklin Mountains have a different degree requirement. Sure. And, and how long have you been with the McGoffin Home? I've been at the, this site coming up on eight years now. And what types of things have taken place there during the time that you've been oh, a manager? It, it, I was just thinking about that earlier. Uh, it, the changes have been dramatic. We've moved some of the offices, uh, opening up more space for uh, guided tours and tour programs. The gift shop is very well established, and it was in its infancy. Inf he was just starting when I came. <laughs> <laughs> um, the tour rooms have changed in that we're striving every day to make it more home-like mm. uh, and less sterile and formal. So we're adding photographs into the rooms and maybe a, a careless newspaper dropped on a piece of furniture, uh, floral arrangements, uh, extra carpets. Uh, and that's just part of our bigger goal towards interior restoration. And you have uh, a staff that works with you? We have a staff. Uh, I have um, an executive secretary or admin tech, administrative technician. Um, I have a clerk and I have a park ranger. Ah. All of us do guided tours and research and uh, interact with the public. And what types of work are they involved in there on an <laughs> average day? I mean, aside from the tours themselves. 
that's one of the great things about being at a historic site is there's no such thing as an average day. Uh, yesterday we had 94 fourth graders by 11 a.m. <laughs> come through the house. Um, we I met with uh, a state architect on designing, finishing up the details to install temperature and humidity controls for the building, um, and then just routine paperwork. Um, so it's it's there's no such thing as an average day, and that's what makes it so much fun. Now, the McGoffin home has a beautiful interior. It and does. You were kind enough to take us around a while back and show us some of the features of the mm -hmm. McGoffin home. Let's take a look at that tour that we had. Good. And then we can talk a little bit about some of the things that have been happening more recently. Great. James McGoffin is the first of the McGoffins to come through this area. Right. How does he how does he get here? <laughs> uh, well, he was born in Kentucky and he left home in his 20s and goes to Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's in on the ground floor of the, the Santa Fe Chihuahua trade. Um, does quite well, settles in Mexico for a while. Uh, that's where he meets and marries his wife, as Maria Gertrudez de los Santos Valdez de Veramendi. Uh, and they have six kids there. Mm. And what happens then? Well, this is, this is the 1830s, uh, into the 30s, beginning of the 40s. And everyone knew when Texas joined the United States that there'd be a war between the United States and Mexico. Um, didn't need a crystal ball. I mean, this was the current politics. He saw that and chose to move his family out of Mexico before it happened. So in 1845, he moves his family from uh, Ciudad Chihuahua to Independence, Missouri, major wagon train caravan. Um, and, and it came to pass, Czech, Texas joined the Union, there was a war, and he continued trade. Hmm. War didn't stop his trade activities. And at the end of the war, uh, he's involved in creating what becomes known as McGoffinsville. Right, right. And where exactly was McGoffinsville? There wasn't much here at this time. There was nothing on the north bank of the Rio Grande. Hmm. The entire town was on the south bank of the Rio Grande, El Paso del Norte. Um, he was traveling with his trade caravan, and when he got ready to cross, he, he found the duties and tariffs on his trade caravan really high. Mm. So he didn't cross. He stopped on this side, built a store and a home, and that was the beginning of McGoffinsville. And from the McGoffin home, that would be about eight blocks to the east. Oh, so the settlement was a little bit further away from where we are today. Right. There's a historical marker at the corner of McGoffin and Willow uh, Streets that kind of marks that site. And what goes on in McGoffinsville? Well, it, it's just one of five little towns that all started right after the Mexican-American War that grew together to become El Paso. Um, so this is the 1848, 1850 time. Uh, we see a lot of uh, travelers passing through the gold rush. Uh, and, and he's in supply and trade and, and provisions for a lot of those folks. And he maintains his trade routes going north and south hmm. and entreats the U.S. Army to establish uh, a post on his property which later becomes the Fort roots Bliss. of Fort Bliss. That's exactly. Right. So James McGoffin is very successful at this trade. He's yes, very he successful in establishing this, uh, uh, establishing this side of, uh, of the river and uh, bringing a lot of people through the area. Right. Uh, what starts to change in the 1850s? Well, it, it's, we're getting a little more settled. There's more farming. And then the next big event that's going to affect the McGoffins is the Civil War. Mm. Uh, and it would affect everybody, not just the McGoffins. And the McGoffins uh, would support the Confederacy uh, and serve in the Confederate Army. And, and it meant that uh, James McGoffin and, and his, his family would actually leave El Paso for a while. Mm. And where did they go to? OK. Uh, James goes to San Antonio. And he's uh, very involved with commissary. Uh, and provisions for the Texas Department of the Confederate Army. Hmm. Um, same thing he was doing private, he's now doing for the military. Uh, his son, Joseph, and the one who built our house, uh, served as an officer um, under General Sibley and was participated in the, the defeat at Glorietta Pass and uh, was stationed towards the end of the war. He was in Houston. Now, after the war, the McGoffins start to have some problems. <laughs> what takes place following the oh, Civil War? Following the Civil War, there were a lot of issues. Mm. Um, none of the McGoffins came right back to El Paso after the Civil War. James is in San Antonio, uh, and that's when he gets word that there had been a flood out here that had completely wiped away McGoffinsville, the house, mm. Fort Bliss, everything wiped away in May of 68. 
Joseph would join his father in San Antonio a little later. Uh, and by September 1st, Joseph is purchasing from his father the McGoffin properties. Uh, and there's a recorded deed, $5,000 for the McGoffin properties in El Paso County. It's all described. Um, and that's real interesting because during the Civil War, a federal court, territorial court in New Mexico had seized the McGoffin property and sold it to somebody else. So when Joseph is buying the land from his father, they're not real sure if they're going to get it back because it was sold to somebody else in the meantime. Uh, but 30 days after Joseph buys the land from his father, his father dies in San Antonio. And that's where James Wiley McLaughlin is buried. Uh, and right after that, Joseph comes on out to El Paso and, and begins a, a lengthy legal process to reclaim the property. And that's when he starts construction of this house. And Joseph becomes a very important person <laughs> in the uh, early years of El Paso. Joseph really made El Paso El Paso. Um, he, he, he helped get the city incorporated in 1873. Um, he would later be elected to serve as mayor four different terms. Uh, while he was mayor, virtually every utility company was established. Uh, he was vice president and stockholder of the First Bank, president and owner of the streetcar company, uh, had a real estate company, uh, saved Fort Bliss when they threatened closure and abandonment, um, responsible for the establishment of public schools and a hospital. Uh, during his tenure, the fire department was established, um, Masonic's Lodge, Elks Club, Pioneer Club, uh, the El Paso Commercial Club, which is the predecessor to the Chamber of Commerce, and the list just keeps going and going and going. It's phenomenal. So the McGoffins were a very well-known family here, and what kinds of activities took place in this home at that time? Well, just as Joseph is civic and political leader in El Paso, this home emerges as the social center for El Paso. Mm. And, and they frequently entertained, and they entertained lavishly. Um, newspapers at the time, about every 10 days to two weeks, were reporting another gala event. Uh, one of my favorite is in 1897, the paper reports that Mayor McGoffin hosted the Mexican consulate for dinner at his rural palatial domicile. Mm. And it goes from there, this language that we've lost. Uh, but that's very typical of the parties they held. Joseph has two children. Right. And the son dies uh, in the early 20th century, and the daughter, Josephine, is left, right. correct? Right, she inherits the house. When Joseph dies in 1923, Josephine takes over. And what does she do with the house? Well, she was a, a military wife that traveled all over the United States, all over the world, um, and she knew modern conveniences. And when she came home uh, and made this her home, she modernized it. She completely remodeled the entire home. Um, basically, she gets rid of all the Victorian touches and goes to a more Southwest Santa Fe look that emerged in the late 20s from the Art Deco trends. And what, what is a southwest santa fe look oh, what things the, do we see that would be different you can see more the the curved lines the smooth plaster finishes white as dominant uh just real clean uncluttered which is a major contrast to the victorian and in order to do that she had to cover up a number of the uh, original fixtures in the she home? covers up and adds some changes makes some changes and things like this fireplace um we knew she did a lot of work to it and we wanted to know how much so we took it apart. That's the only way to find out for sure. Mm. Uh, so we took the plaster off the right side, exposed the red bricks. We numbered the bricks before we removed them so that every brick can go back to its original location. Pulled the bricks out. Behind the bricks, you see wallpaper. Um, and she either removed the papers from the walls or completely covered them. Uh, in this room, we found three layers of wallpaper. Mm. And Josephine lives in the house how long? the rest of her life, and she had a rich, wonderful life. She dies in 1968 at the age of 96. Hmm. So she enjoyed her remodeling for 40 years. And her husband lived a long time as well? Oh, yes. He was uh, recognized as the oldest living graduate of West Point in 1964. He dies in 1967 at the age of 101. So the McGoffins are still here in the 1960s living in the home, and what happens to the home after Josephine and her husband are gone? Um, Josephine leaves the house to her children, 
and, and she had three surviving children at that time. And it was her children uh, in 1976 that decided to sell the home so it could be preserved as a historic site. One of the daughters, uh, Octavia Glasgow, was living in the house at the time and retained life tenancy when the house was sold. Um, four rooms on the north end of the house became her apartment. Uh, and she lived here even after we opened as a, as a museum and, and started giving tours. Continued to live here until her death in 1986. Now, what kind of work was done on the place as it became a historic site, as it changed from being a private residence to a site? A lot of the work we did at that time was more repair and stabilization than, than a great deal of other things. Um, the house was uh, 120, 100 to 120 years old. Um, it needed a lot of repair. We, we immediately came in and, and upgraded all the, the electrical to code. Uh, we were concerned about fire hazards. Uh, and, and those are the things we addressed immediately uh, and stabilization of, of the old adobe walls. When did the McGoffin home actually open to the public? Well, there was some limited visitation in the late 70s. Uh, and the big ribbon cutting was, was uh, one of the bicentennial projects for the city. Uh, but regular tours really don't start till 1981. 1981. And how long is the last MacGuffin in the home? Um, Octavia Glasgow. Uh, and it's interesting to note she was born in, in this house in 1900, and she dies in this house in 1986, at the age of 86. And so just 13, 14 years ago, we had family here. And the remaining MacGuffins, they there are participate descendants, in the Yes, home? there are descendants all over the United States, and some live here in El Paso. Uh, and they're very involved with the home and involved with the friends group that helps support us, the Casa MacGuffin Compañeros. Now, what we see here in the MacGuffin home are original furnishings. Right. Uh, this is a little bit different than you might see in other locations. Could you tell us We're about that? We're very, very fortunate to have all original furnishings in the home. When you come to the McGoffin home and look around, this is the McGoffin furniture. It's not just appropriate period things. It's common in other sites. I mean, the collection here is just phenomenal. Um, furniture's been in the house since they purchased it, so it's been here for over 110 years. Over 100 years. years the family yeah. has used it. Yeah. Uh, can we talk a little bit about some of the individual pieces here, the piano? Well, the piano was shipped by train from Baltimore on perhaps one of the first freight trains to reach El Paso in 1881. Hmm. It's a square grand. Um, Cherrywood has a great tone. Hmm. And the chairs, uh, the sofa the and chairs seem yeah, to have this, an interesting uh, design. This parlor set uh, is East Lake style. And, and the back piece on each chair, it comes off. It's just kind of pegged on. And it's been customized locally for the McGoffins. And it features a Mexican eagle and a horseshoe. And that's not normally a design you're going to get out of New England. I understand that there are some other residents or visitors to the house <laughs> occasionally? Um, yes. The general consensus is that there may be three spirits here. Uh, and then it's uh, a male and two women. We think the man might be Uncle Charlie. That would be Joseph's brother-in-law. Um, and he was known as kind of a practical joker. And, and the fun stuff that happens in the house, we attribute to Uncle Charlie. Um, there's a lady in blue that's seen walking around the outside of the house uh, at night. There's, uh, we have 23 different police reports filed on that by our neighbors. Mm. Um, and then there's a female spirit inside the house that just seems to be a little more mellow. And what do the spirits do in the house? Mm -hmm. um, I think the most active, again, is probably Uncle Charlie. Uh, he's turned lights on and off. Um, he regularly likes to play with the security system and sound off the alarms and wake up the neighbors and make the police drive by. Uh, uh, he, I think he likes noise. He seems to attend all of our parties and special events. Uh, just enjoys life in the McGoffin home. The 97 Texas legislature granted a $60 million for, uh, program to fund capital repairs in the Parks and Wildlife Department. We're benefiting from that now. Um, this project, we're removing all the exterior plaster from our 125-year-old adobe home, examining the adobe, and then we'll replaster uh, with the material uh, mostly that they would have used 100 years ago. 
And what do we find when we take the plaster off? <laughs> there seems to be a bit of a difference in the adobe right. places. Right. Here, right here is, is a junction of two different walls. The entire house wasn't all built at the same time. And, and we knew that, and, and it's visible. It's kind of like archaeology on a building. Hmm. Uh, and you can start seeing the different material making the adobe and the color difference. And this was the, the butt end of a wall that went that way in a big part of the house. This room was added on five or ten years later. And, and we suspected that, but we can prove it now. We can see it. Uh, how did the renovation work turn out on the exterior? We were in the middle of that when that's we were right, out there. That's right. It looks wonderfully. Um, it, good, clean finish, historically accurate. Uh, we used a historic photograph that showed the scoring pattern uh, and made sure as we scored that plaster again that it matched the, to the woodwork of the historic photo. You can't get much more accurate than that. And the finishing touches, what, what were the final things that needed to be done to it? Just a cleaning up, the in, the patio needed some a, a second coat of, of plaster. That area is not scored, so it gets an extra coat. Um, making sure we had a good seal between the plaster and the sidewalk. Uh, we don't want moisture going under under the edge of the plaster to that original adobe wall, um, caulking and sealing, uh, but we're real happy with the outcome. Great. Now, I understand the next phase is the interior, and you've been working on that a little bit. What, uh, what needed to be done there? <laughs> what things are you looking at? Interior restoration is, is an ongoing challenge, and, and we're looking at some fruition as some major steps uh, in the near future. For years, we've been gathering research on the wallpapers and paint finishes and what type of ceilings they used, canvas ceiling, and was it painted or papered, uh, what furniture goes where, all of those hundred different details. How, how do you research uh, something like <laughs> wallpapers or paint? We're fortunate at the McGoffin home in that um, when they removed the wallpaper to apply the interior plaster, they didn't pull the paper fragments out from behind the baseboards and door frames. Mm. So we've lifted up a lot of woodwork and found strips and, and pieces of wallpaper in every room. Wow. And we're analyzing all of that. Um, for the most part, we'll be using the third layer of five uh, throughout the home. We haven't specifically narrowed the period. We had initially thought we would restore to the mid-1890s. Um, but we're looking at moving it up a little bit to turn of the century. Uh, it allows us to introduce a few more subject and storylines into the interpretation that we feel are important to include. Now when you find out what kind of wallpaper uh -huh. was there, I, I imagine you can't just walk into a store and buy something <laughs> that matches today. Not what do locally you, do? you can't. <laughs> Some of the wallpaper companies um, in the United States have been in business almost 200 years. Uh, and one of the foremost wallpaper companies is Scala Mandre. Um, they have huge office in Houston. They have their archive in New York City, and they have representative paper from their collection going back 200 years. We'll be very fortunate if they're still reproducing one of our papers. If not, they have the patterns, and we can have them custom printed. Um, the furnishings, other things in the interior, what are we looking at? We are, again, this site is just an amazing site for its um, comprehensive collection. We have probably 80% of the original family furniture. Mm -hmm. We have a series of about 14 interior photographs um, from the turn of the century, late 90s to 1901, um, showing the furniture placement uh, in several different rooms, and that f we still have that furniture. Um, so, so there's no guesswork about what went where. We can see for ourselves. 
Now, I understand that you have a volunteer organization, right. the Casa Magoffin Compañeros. That's right. Uh, what kinds of things do they do? They have been a tremendous asset in helping with the research. They have funded a trip to New York to that wallpaper archive. They've uh, helped fund paint sample analysis. Uh, they help fund all kinds of special needs and projects for us. Uh, the state always seems to be in a budget crisis sure. uh, and the compañeros are, are one of our fundraising arms that will help us uh, obtain things we need uh, from simple things like a sound system for special events um, to that in detailed uh, research projects um, and they're the group that does that for us. And there are a number of events that take place uh, have, around the year? We do. We have three annual events. Um, there are two high tees, two Victorian teas. Uh, one is the first Sunday in May, and it's usually held on the grounds in a garden party. Um, the second one is our holiday tea, which will be the first Sunday in December. Hmm. Um, those are annual events. There will be two sittings at each event, so it's you know you can make reservations to come at one or at three, um, and you are seated and serve tea and biscuits and scones and a plate of savories and a plate of sweets, and then a tour of the home. Our third annual event is our candlelight tour. Um, People today really have grown too accustomed to electricity. And our candlelight tours, we literally turn off every electric light in the home. We bring in candles and kerosene lamps and light it entirely uh, by kerosene and candlelight. So it's more representative of what the home would have looked like on an evening a hundred years ago. And if someone is interested in volunteering or helping out? Please uh, call us. We'll find, we'll match our needs to your interests, um, both through the home directly in our docent program, which is primarily tour guides, uh, through the Casa Magafan Compañeros, um, to help with the teas or the candlelight tours or research. Recently, we've started a, a, another project. It's, we don't have enough to do, so we keep adding work. Mary Kay Shannon, we certainly want to thank you for coming in today and telling us all about the uh, McGoffin home. And uh, we'll get out there and take a look at some of the work that's done in the future and maybe look at those interiors a bit Great. later. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And we want to thank all of you as well for joining us today on Along the Rio Grande. And we hope to see you on our next program.